I wrote about gay love uh, not realizing that I was taking on the taboo uh, because I wrote about it in a way that seemed so easy and so harmonious and so accepting that it never occurred to me that really I had to sort of bring in the typical uh, villains, the people who kill gays, who beat them up, who mock them, who bully them. Uh, I didn't want to invite these people into the relationship. And finally, you know, two men can have a good relationship and not worry. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishna Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. And my guest today is the author and teacher, Andre Asiman. Now, he's perhaps best known right now for Call Me By Your Name, which, although written many years ago, was turned into a hugely successful movie in 2017. And he's now written a sequel to that story, Find Me. Welcome. Thank you for having me. In the unlikely event that people don't know Call Me By Your Name, tell us about the characters and, and the, the, char- the three characters you've picked up in the sequel. In the sequel. Um, well, there is the father called Sammy now, uh, because he did, never had a name in the original novel, but in Find Me does. And it's about his being in a train and meeting Miranda. And then five years later, you encounter Elio, who is in Paris and is a pianist and is having a relationship with a man. And finally, in the third chapter, we have Oliver, who is in New York, about to move back to his college town. And he's invited at a dinner party two people that he's very attracted to, a man and a woman. Now, people say of you that you write about love, about obsession and desire. Is that that what you feel you're writing about yourself? Yes, I think it is. It's about desire and about wanting people. And at the same time that you want them, you realize that you either won't have them or that you really don't desperately want them. And so it's this tussle between two competing desires that are constantly there. And I love exploring them. And um, um, why? I mean, how long have you been exploring that? Oh, all my life. Uh, you know, I started by wanting a toy and then saying to myself, you really don't want it, even though you could have it. And when I did have it, there was always this sort of buyer's remorse, the disappointment. Oh, is this all it was? I thought it was going to change my life. It never did. You know, you buy a pair of shoes that you think are going to change your life. You meet someone very interesting who's going to change your life. They never do. You bring yourself wherever you go. Your, your life now is, I suppose, as a, as a New Yorker, an East mm-hmm. Coast American. Yes. But it began in Egypt. Yes. As part of a Jewish minority. Yes. H- how come? Uh, because my parents, uh, actually my father, in order not to serve in the Turkish army, he was born Turkish, but he never felt Turkish, uh, escaped and moved to Egypt, where the rest of the family had settled. In other, they could have gone to the United States, but instead they went to Egypt. They became very wealthy, so they did very well for themselves, but it didn't last. And after 1956, they realized that there was no future for them in Egypt, and they left a trickle at a time. One went to France, the others went to England, to Italy, to South America, everywhere. And we stayed, I think we were the last leg of the family, and we stayed in 1965. That's, you're talking about nine years after it was obvious that no Europeans and no Jews were welcome there. Why did your parents stay? I think because they, they liked it. They liked the lifestyle. And I don't blame them. I didn't like the lifestyle, but they did. And they were wealthy. So, they, they, you know, you don't, just don't close shop and leave without any sense of where the future is going to be or what it's going to hold. Um, and you can ask the same thing about people in Germany. Very few people left Germany when they knew the writing was on the wall. So you just stick and hang around until they actually kick you out. How oppressive was it? I mean, how much do you remember? How old were you? I was 14 when I left, so I remember everything. Um, It was oppressive because it was very nationalistic. And if you were not an Egyptian, we were Italian. Um, You felt that basically you were a foreigner in the country where you were born and whose language you knew and whose customs you partook of. So in, in many ways, you felt that you were being expelled or pushed out regularly every day. You felt it every day. People would follow you in the street and insult you, or sometimes even throw stones at you. So it became very oppressive. Was it being Italian or being Jewish? It was, I don't think it was being a foreigner. You're not, you don't look Egyptian. Just not Egyptian. Not Egyptian. And therefore you must have been either a colonialist or you took advantage of the colonial system in order to make money, or you were Jewish, which was the worst of all combinations. 
I mean, you say you didn't like the lifestyle. Why, why not? What was it? I didn't like? like it because it was clear to me that I was never going to end up there. I couldn't wait to go to Europe. Of course, I had this imaginary land called Europe where I was going to be saved. Again, one of those things that you long for. And when you get there, you say, oh, my God, this is backward. I thought it was going to be advanced and Western and all that sort of thing. And you realize that they can't even pronounce the word Palmolive or Colgate because they 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 sort of bastardize everything that you thought was sort of universal. Um, no, I, I didn't feel there because in my classes especially, uh, I felt that I was singled out as the only Jew. And it was very uncomfortable to be the only Jew in a class of, you know, mostly Muslims and there were a few Catholics and a few Orthodox Greeks. But I was the only Jewish boy, so if you, I'll give you the best example. When you're in swimming class, you always have a cold so that you won't have to swim. Because once you undress, people will notice there's a stark difference somewhere in your body, and you don't want to even engage that conversation. So how, how Jewish were you? I was not at all, and I've never been. Um, I was, uh, I did not like religion. Um, I think it was the culture of the family. We celebrated Christmas and we celebrated Easter and Passover, both. But Christmas was a big deal, so we had lots of presents at Christmas. Uh, I was never bar mitzvah. My father asked me, do you need a bar mitzvah? I said, absolutely not. And he said, fine. And that was the end of it. There was, there was no religion in my family. Thank God. I mean, yeah, I should thank him because I was not religious. So, um, But it was, it was very freeing. So I was being essentially um, persecuted for being something that I didn't feel I was. If Call Me By Your Name is about adolescent desire, mm. to some degree, I mean, how much of that was yours? I mean, was it your experience? I was always a desiring person. I, I was always desiring people. I, I still am. I mean, I long for people. I love making conversation with strangers. If it's a beautiful person, I like it even more. Um, I don't do anything, all right? But uh, I like the... the why the, not? The, 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 why not? Because I'm married and I'm, <laughs> and I'm very faithful to my wife. And, uh, and I have a family. I have all those things. But I like the idea of it. And it stirs me up. And that's how I wrote um, Find Me, because I was on a train and somebody beautiful sat next to me on the train and we started talking it was lovely it didn't last long because she got off the train two stops later but nevertheless it it got me going and i started a story so the story and find me about the beginning about of the story the, the father meeting yes uh, it's, it's, the, the woman is is you it's me <laughs> totally me uh, and i she had a dog the man in the story has a dog. She, she has a dog in the story. Uh, she asks him to hold the dog while she goes to the bathroom. That's exactly what she asked of me. Uh, and so I, I thought it was lovely. It, it was one of those moments that you know nothing is going to happen, but you're grateful that it brought the thought to your mind. You said, I mean, I don't want to pry, but I mean, you said, uh, you know, you're married and you're faithful to your wife. I, I read that that wasn't what you grew up with. No. As far as your father was concerned. No, my father was, maybe that's why I'm so faithful. It's because my father was very unfaithful, um, legendary in the city, and to the point where my teachers would ask me, you know, does your father stay at home? It, it, they must have known something. And I would say, yeah, yeah, he's always at home, that sort of thing. You know, of course I lied. Uh, no, he was always gallivanting, and, uh, but he was a successful businessman who led, you know, the kind of life that people with money wanted to lead. And uh, did that bother you? I mean, and is that why it bothered, like that? it bothered my mother a lot, a great deal. And they had huge fights. And of course, he didn't live at home, so he didn't care. But um, it bothered me. Well, I didn't have a father and I wanted a father. And I knew how important the family structure was because I had friends who had families that were very stable and I envied them that. But I, uh, of course, at the same time that I'm saying all this, when I grew up, I was sort of 16, 17, my father would confide in me and tell me about why he wasn't happy. And I said, you know, you're totally right, Dad. I can understand. Keep doing what you're doing. So I can be on both sides of the equation. So faithfulness isn't important of itself. It is important because you can't have a very good family life if you're not faithful to it. So I, I believe in it, and I've always resented the possibility of even sort of going beyond the pale. Uh, I, I enjoy the thought, but not the, the deed. I don't do the deed. And what do, what do you think um, faithfulness 
Oh. gives a relationship. Oh, it's wonderful because, it, you know, we always say we don't want to be taken for granted. Uh, it's as if it's an insult or, almost, but it's not. To be taken for granted means that you, you're trusted. Uh, you trusted to be there. You trusted to explain where you were if you were somewhere. You you don't cross the line, and uh, and I I love that idea, and because it it gives it certain aura of of oh, I hate using the term of moral cleanliness. I sound like a right wing person, but it it is true. There's something about uh, having a family and being there for the family and thinking of the family that is a wonderful feeling. And I've tried to instill that in my, my sons. I have three sons and they all have relationships where they're very faithful. And it's a lovely thing. And well, is it about morality or is it about it's not, utilitarianism, it's not. if you like? <laughs> well, it's, it, it's, it works. Put it this way, it works. And I like the idea that it works. I, I, morality has always struck me as a, as a difficult concept because at the same time that one sort of espouses moral things, I'm also, and that's thanks to my father, a person who hates taboos. And I hate uh, taboos. That, so that uh, at the same time that I want, you know, a certain kind of order and harmony to exist in a family, and it can only exist if there is trust. At the same time, I hate the people who espouse moral, um, sort of, uh, who have taboos in their lives, and and are sort of have shrunken ideas about what a taboo is and w what to do with people who cross the line. Where, where does that come from then? I think because Alexandria was like that. It was a place where you, you didn't necessarily do anything evil, but at the same time you were open, and that's where I come in. You accepted other people for whatever they did. In other words, we had friends who were gays back in the 1950s and 60s, when the rest of Europe, you know, you wouldn't even tell people you were Yes, uh, you wouldn't tell people that you were gay. And uh, basically it was all accepted. And it was a very open society. Um, Is that because it was a very wealthy set that you were in? Or? No. I mean, it sounds so unlikely. Because of Alexandria? Yes, I mean, in the, in the 1950s and 60s, you're saying to, to, for people to be open about those sorts but of But it topics. was. In other words, it wasn't. You're talking about 1968 in Europe, where things began to open up radically. These things were already basically accepted in Egypt, particularly in the Alexandria that I lived. I, mean, I have no idea what other people did in Alexandria, but in the circle we traveled in, which was not necessarily wealthy, it was just comfortable. Uh, people did what they wanted, and nobody seemed to mind. Is that why you wrote about gay love? Yes. Because you wanted I, to take on the taboo. I, I didn't want to take on the taboo. I wrote about gay love uh, not realizing that I was taking on the taboo uh, because I wrote about it in a way that seemed so easy and so harmonious and so accepting that it never occurred to me that really I had to sort of bring in the typical uh, villains, the people who kill gays, who beat them up, who mock them, who bully them. Uh, I didn't want to invite these people into the relationship. And finally, you know, two men can have a good relationship and not worry. Because people have said, people have wondered how realistic it is, isn't it? You know, the, the idea of uh, an adolescent boy finding a relationship with a man, his parents having seemingly no problem with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and whether that really happens. It should happen. As Aristotle says, you know, art is not about what happens, but about what should and ought to happen. And I think that there are so many readers who tell me, I, A, that they wish their parents were like this, and B, that the book helped them to come out to their parents. Parents who basically, as I like to say, already knew anyway. And it's, it's, it's such, it's it basically, it's, a, it's as if without knowing it, I had turned a new page in sort of public morality. Without ever setting out? No, no. So because you, you don't write to change the world, do you? I don't think I do. Uh, I, I want, put it this way, everybody in my books, almost everyone is kind. And they like being kind and they're appreciated for being kind. They're not sort of pouring sort of oily kindness. They're just nice people. Uh, and uh, that's what I—that's what I feel 
comfortable with. Uh, even the portrait of my father. My father was a very strict man. At the same time, he was very openly, in, he has his own morality. Um, but, and he also taught me a few things about morality, which were useful. Uh, on the one hand, he was very strict, but at the same time, I knew, not only from hearsay, but that he was really a very good, kind man. And so I wanted to show the good, kind man that he really was and sort of, uh, sort of scatter away and push away the, the, the fact that he was cheating on my mother all the time. Do you think most people are? Good, I... kind. Yes. Can you think of people who are truly, truly evil? I can't think of anyone. I mean, there must be some because we have the word for it. But basically, I think nobody is really that evil. And people like being kind. So you're, you're, you're not writing in that world because you want to escape the, the meanness of the real world. No. It's just that you think that is the real world. I think so too. Yes, you're right. You're totally right. People are fundamental. Today I was at a train station trying to buy a ticket in a rush and I asked people online, could you let me get through because my train is about to leave? They said, well, my train is about to leave. But everybody else let me in through. They, they allowed me in. Yes, please go ahead. And I do the same thing to people. When you're at an airport and somebody's about to miss their plane, you let them through. It's a nice thing. It gets passed along, you know. So do you think the sort of, um, you know, there's a sort of a sense of moral panic at the moment, I suppose, in America and yes. the year. Yes. About yeah. the kind of world we live in. Yes, true. Do you think we've got that wrong? No, we have it very right. Um, it's an ugly, ugly world that we have basically brought upon ourselves. Um, I didn't bring it on because I didn't vote for him. Uh, but I think that a lot of people had some sort of panic and anger in their hearts, anger particularly, that pushed them to vote for people who are fundamentally offensive. Where does that fit in with people being fundamentally good and kind? Because they are not bad people. Uh, I mean, there are some bad people who basically love to hear that someone was executed. And I'm going like, ugly, you know, I don't care what crime he committed. It's an ugly thing to kill someone. Uh, and there are people who like this, but I don't know them and I wouldn't want to know them. But I think that there is a, a degree, it's not that people are cruel, it's that they're angry. They're afraid of what's happening to them, to their good old world that no longer exists and they're losing it and they want to hold on to it. I'm thinking of, you know, the people who are miners, for example, and find that the mines are being shut and there's no more money in mining and so on. So I understand their panic, but at the same time, um, they, they feel that they need to have a voice. And so they bring in someone who's, first of all, never going to do a thing about minors. So what do you think the answer is then to embracing change? We have to embrace change. We have to, we have to think, we have to, th I mean, look at Barack Obama. Uh, he's a man who represented change at its most elementary level. At all the levels, it was there. Everything was going to be new. He had a hard time instituting the changes he wanted to bring about, but fundamentally he was a good man with good ideas and sound ideas and a good vision of the world. It didn't work for some reason, and that's not his fault. It's the fault of the people who decided to vote elsewhere. How much did you have to leave behind in your moves? Because you've been a migrant. Yes, all my life. All yes. my life. Yes. Uh, yes, I left behind, first of all, a fortune. Uh, in, in Egypt, which was taken from us, just as all revolutions do. Uh, and I resent that because they've invited me back and they said, we're going to build the temples again and we want Jews back. And my answer was, well, give me my money first and then we'll see. Uh, no, there's money there, uh, which I will never forget. And I don't want my children to forget. And that's one of those things that gets passed on generation after generation. Um, there's resentment too. Um, but I, I find that being a person who has never had a stable home has also defined me in many ways. Uh, you don't have a st stable home. You don't have a sense that you belong in a country whose flag you have embraced. Um, at the same time, you feel that 
this could be taken away from you. You live with that other thought, the one that this home could be taken away from you because that's what happened to you know, my family and my ancestors. And I'm talking about three generations past. Everything was taken from us many, many times. And so you sort of know that however stable things look and however wonderful your Saturday night dinner with friends is, it could all disappear. You still feel that now? Yes, I still do. And sometimes I think I make myself feel this because that's how I, I sort of feel that I'm being realistic. Uh, of course, I shouldn't because things are good and I'm happy. And uh, things, I mean, I, I, shouldn't be, I shouldn't even tell you that I'm happy because that could be taken away from me. Ideally, um, I don't belong anywhere and I wish I did. At the same time, I have made my home in something that I call paper. Paper is really where I go to be at home. And it's not a good home because paper, as you know, is easily tossed into the wastebasket. So you don't feel American? I am American. I am a New Yorker, that's for sure. But I don't think I'm American the way people in Missouri are American or in Alabama or Mississippi. I'm not their kind of American. And I'm sure that if I walked in the street, they would look at me askance as, what are you doing here? I mean, what, what you say about that sort of need to be aware that you could lose it all. Yes. Um, you may have to go. They may kick you out. I mean, that's a very sort of immigrant yes. mentality all over the world. Yes. It's also particularly something Jewish people say, um, you know, have the bag ready yes. in case you have to go. I've, I've heard that from a lot of older generation Jews. Um, you know, do you feel it both in both senses or... I mean, as a Jew, yeah. I think it's inculcated culturally that you could lose everything. Don't count your blessings too much because they could all disappear. It may be a Jewish thing, and it, I may have inherited probably from rabbinical sources, but by the time they got to me, these values are totally filtered and they become a way of life without any reference or antecedent to Judaism. Could you explain that for people who may not understand this idea that you can be culturally Jewish without being religious? Uh, well, you're born into a Jewish family. It's like being born a Catholic. You're born into a Catholic family. You may not want religion. You may have no need for it. You may have no place for it. However, there are certain things that Catholics do and certain things that Jewish people believe in or accept automatically that are among Jews, they're usually negative things. They're not positive things. They're not self-affirming things. They're usually protective and uh, don't show your wealth too much. Don't don't tell people how wealthy you are because you could lose it. They might want to rob you of it. So always never say that you're happy. Say that you could be happier. Uh, it's these kind of mollifiers that people use in order to avert bad for fortune because bad fortune is looking out for you. It's, it's seeking you out. So you're trying to play games with this evil um, whatever it is that's out there. And have you passed all of that on to your children? What I've passed on is a sense of irony, which they have a lot of. Uh, irony is basically the ability to, to be in one place and anticipate the contrary uh, as well. Uh, it's, it's an ability to, to coexist with paradox. And, but irony is, is a sense, I think that if there were a God, he would have a profound sense of irony. In other words, I'm going to give you this, but I'm going to also poison it for you so that at the same time, you will enjoy it for a day, but it will be taken away just when you're beginning to believe that it's yours permanently. How did you become a writer? I was always going to be a writer. I think I began writing poetry. I have no idea why, but strangely enough, my father is the one who encouraged me, said, oh, what a wonderful poem you've written. And of course it was dreadful, but it doesn't matter. He made me feel that writing poetry was a good thing. And so I produced more poems, probably because I, I had a satisfaction, but also because I was being complimented. The whole family knew I was a poet. And so they accepted that. Then I realized at some point at the age of 16, I think, that I was a dreadful poet. And for me, um, the decision was an easy one. I'm not going to be a poet. I'm going to step down a bit and go to prose. And I write prose as if I were a failed poet. And I think that works. For me, it does. What do you mean by that? Just explain it. Uh, a failed poet is, I mean, if you think of the two great failed poets of the 20th century, 
Proust is one of them, and Joyce is the other. They wrote poetry, but it wasn't great poetry. Uh, the real poetry, they basically transmuted into their prose. Their prose is the best prose that was ever, ever written in any language. And the reason is that they essentially brought all the tools that they had acquired as poets, and they dumped them into their prose. And their prose is, as you know, there's nothing like it. And so what was the first novel? The first, it was a memoir. It was about my, um, my childhood and early adolescence that in Egypt. That was out of Egypt? Out of Egypt, yes. And it was a book that I, I was asked to write it. I didn't really want to write it, but I wrote it because everybody was asking me, you should put this down into it. So, so I wrote it. And I wrote it as a sort of a, a melancholic comedy. And I think the voice was right for that particular kind of book. And, uh, and it worked. It was quite successful. And, uh, and then I decided you know, to write many essays, after which I wrote Call Me By Your Name. So how, how old were you when you wrote Out of Egypt? I was oh, late. I was 37, 38. So what have you been doing all that time? Practicing. <laughs> That's what it was. It was just, a, I, was, I was always writing. I just didn't like what I was writing. It didn't have a voice that I felt was going to speak to anyone else. So how were you living? How were you making I was, Oh, no, I was teaching. Uh, oh, I did a lot of things in my life. I worked on Wall Street for a while. I worked in advertising. Uh, and eventually I finished my dissertation and was, became a professor. Uh, actually, to change this, I, I finally wrote Out of Egypt when I was 42. I started it when I was 38, 37, and finished it at, 30, at 42 with many, many interruptions. That's a long time. It wasn't, because I just, I, I wrote it actually in, in, uh, on a sabbatical term, which I took in order to write a book that I knew was not going to get me tenure, but I wanted to write that book. There's a good 10 years between Call Me By Your Name, yes. the book, and the, and the film. Yes. Um, I mean, why, why did it take so long, do you think? And how transformative was it when the film came out? Um, by the, you see, when I finished Call Me By Your Name, I was writing another novel. I interrupted it, wrote Call Me By Your Name, and went back to the other novel, hoping that that novel was going to become a success. It was a tremendous flop, uh, that novel. But Call Me By Your Name did very, very well. Uh, I wrote it very fast, didn't take it very seriously, but just went, wrote it in three and a half months, so that was fast. Um, but the, when the movie came out, um, I thought, you know, I never believed the movie was going to be made because it took so long for the producers to find a director who wanted to do the film and the actors and so on. But when the movie came out, um, I didn't even go to Sundance to see it because I figured I'm going to see it on TV. One of those things. And then I get all these amazing emails and tweets all night long that it's playing at Sundance telling me what an amazing success it is. So I said, OK, I'm going to have to see it the next time around. When is that going to be? It was showing in Berlin. So I went to see it in Berlin. I was wowed. It was an amazing film. It has kept everything that was in the book. Uh, what it cut out are scenes that would, did not fit the plot of the film, which is fine. Uh, but it captured the mood, the, the lyricism of the, of the place, of the characters, the kindness of the father certainly was there. And uh, it was an amazing film. But you weren't involved in making it at all? Not at all. No, I didn't want to. I, I felt that, you know, I didn't want to be one of those authors, you know, who essentially intrude on the director and the producer and complain and, and basically bellyache all the time and become offensive. So I, I just didn't want to get involved. And I trusted them. I trusted James Ivory and I trusted Luca Guadagnino. I knew they were fantastic. So there was no, there was no room for me to say anything. What effect does it have on the way people see you, your public persona, when mm. you're, you know, your, your fame, if you like, suddenly is, is greater for a film for, of your book than the book? It's, it's nice. It's, it's, it's lovely, put it this way. I, I love the fact that the film did so well that it helped the book and it helped all my books. That's fine. As far as my persona goes, 
I go to sp- do a lot of speaking engagements, and I love speaking to the public, and I particularly like questions from the public. So I always allow a, more than a margin of questions to the m- public. And what I find most people say to me, I mean, people say, you've changed my life, you've, you've written me, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the compliments that people tell me is that, I thought you were a very sad person. You're a funny man. I said, yes, I like humor. I'm a very serene person when I get on stage, and I love it. I love the fact that I'm engaging with an audience that likes my book or likes the film. I don't care. They will eventually also like me. And it's a lovely feeling. Are you, are you um, as obsessive um, in life as your characters? I was. I engage with the, the cloud, as it were, of a person and the cloud around them, and I want to find out more about them. I, mean, I think everybody uh, basically pursues someone in their mind. I'm not talking about following someone sure. to their house. Now, that's a way. disgusting yeah. thing to do. Uh, no, but it's, it's more like you're constantly uh, invoke. What is, what is she doing? What is he doing? Whatever. You're trying to find out without asking. And so you, you construe th- sort of narratives in your mind uh, and you don't let them go. So that's called obsession. I don't know, but I know that everybody does it. I think we fantasize, you know, most of our time is spent fantasizing. Do you think love is always obsessive? Can it be love if it's not obsessive? I mean, I cannot think, I mean, you're in love with someone, you're not obsessed about them. What kind of diluted form of feeling is that? I want to be obsessive. I want to know. I want, I want to think about you all the time. What, what about the transition of time? Because obviously Call Me By Your Name is about mm. young men and this book is set a little later, is it, is it easier to think about young love than older love? No, but I like unconditional, uh, sort of unconventional loves. Those are the ones that I truly like. Every, every love relationship that I've written about is fundamentally, uh, it's not the cookie cutter kind of love. I'm not interested in John who is 20 and Mary who's 20 and they meet at a party and they go and sort of live together and whatever. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the, the tensions that exist between people. Uh, let's say one person is married, the other person is not. There's a tension there, uh, especially, I mean, I wrote my dissertation on precisely a married woman and a man who's in love with her and she's in love with him and they don't ever speak or they basically say a few words and that's it. There's tension. I love tension like that. I, I believe that tension like that is, um, is found in most of our lives. They are there, those tensions. And I love the fact that you have a woman who is in her, let's say, early 30s, and she's on a train with a man who's 50. And they start having a conversation. It's not a conventional conversation. It's not two 50-year-olds talking about their divorces and their grandchildren and, you know, what elementary school are they going to go to. It's, I find that terribly boring. Uh, I'm more interested in what it is that an older man can bring to a girl and what it is that she can bring to the man that he no longer has hope, um, love, energy, excitement. Um, these are the things that I think that a younger person can give to an older person. And what does an older person bring? You know, it's a sort of wisdom and acceptance of the way things are in life, uh, a kind of um, sort of more, it, a smoother approach to relationships than young people are who are much more sort of energetic. You're still teaching, aren't you? Yes. I mean, in fact, you teach Proust. Among um, others, yes. <laughs> amongst other things. I mean, why, why you, I imagine you don't have to do that anymore. So why do you... Still do it. Oh, I do it because I love my students. I, I do love them. I mean, I care for them. I want them to find jobs. I mean, they're all graduate students. So they're all writing their dissertations. And they're, they're interesting people. So I love to, to be able to give a hand. And plus, I love exchanging ideas about the most difficult thing to teach in a literature class, which is style. I like to tell people, look at the style and follow the sentence, just the sentence. Forget the meaning, forget everything else. Just look at the order of the words. And when you teach people that, you're teaching people how to read, which many people don't know how to do. How do you you read? 
you, I, I, I listen for the voice of the author. I listen for the style. I want to see what, what is, is the sentence long or short? Why is, it, why is this particular sentence short? And why is this one long? What does a long sentence tell us about the patience it takes to read it and about the author who decided that he's going to put me through this sentence in order to have me understand why he's doing it and what is fundamentally being revealed at the end of the sentence. These are sort of banal questions, but they're, they're far more interesting than other ways of teaching literature, which sometimes I don't like. And do you think you can teach that? You can teach You style. can teach, yes, you can actually do it. And it takes time, but you, you basically want people to learn how to, um, to set aside the conventional, for example, symbols. People have always taught symbols in literature. I hate symbols. They mean nothing to me. I don't listen to symbols. I want to see, you know, first of all, I'd like to see what the plot is like, because that's interesting. But I want to see how the plot is being conveyed to me. What are the devices? the linguistic devices that somebody sort of uses in order to have me react in the way they want me to react. Who do you love reading then? I, I always like to read psychological writers, in other words, not Freudian psychological, but people who are interested in what motivates people to behave the way they do. For example, Jane Austen, Edith Wharton. These are fantastic writers. They're interested, not in plot, there's hardly any real plot. It's all about dynamics between individuals. One person basically playing checkers with the other person and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's brilliant. Are there any contemporary writers you would point us to? I, I happen to like one in particular because she's very, very good. Her name is Nicole Krauss and she is absolutely brilliant at that sort of thing. She, is, she gets it. Uh, not many people have the patience to write about the dynamics between human beings. So are these lost arts then, do you think? I think it's uh, right now we're into action. Um, Game of Thrones is very big. Uh, and I understand that Game of Thrones also sort of mandates the kind of writing that's going to happen around it. Uh, and one has to accept that. But I think that it could come back because at some point people will get tired of action and of special effects that you get in everything nowadays. Um, I think that people sitting in a coffee shop having a conversation that is not really the conversation they're having, but it's another conversation which they can't quite speak about is is wonderful. A man and a woman sitting, or a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, flirting with each other without seeming to. I love that. I ask everybody, if, if you could just change the world, how would you change it? I would, I would like people to be, first of all, less angry, because that is a, that's a, a poison. They're angry and they're afraid, and I want them not to vote, or not to think with anger, but to, and not necessarily to forgive, because that's a difficult one, but they, that they should explore ways of making the world um, happier, serene, as opposed to filled with what we have nowadays, with sort of this riot of meanness and small-mindedness. Let us be better than that. Andre Asselman, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Sharing your ways to change the world. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you did, then please do give us a rating and a review. This is actually the uh, last edition of this particular series, Series 3 of Ways to Change the World. We'll be taking a short break and be back very soon. Our producers are Sarah Goff and Rachel Evans. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>